Welcome back to another Box Score Geek show. I'm your host, Dre Alvarez, and with me, as always, is my producer, voice of God, man of many hats, Brian Foster. Holy cow, Brian, it has been a while, even though, yep. guess what? It seems like no time at all, because I learned a secret after doing this for however many years. You can, like, pre-record podcasts and then release them at a segmented interval. So hopefully everybody has enjoyed the recent podcast with Ben Guest and Dave Barry. Also, another trick apparently you can do, Brian, if you record a really long podcast, you can cut it in half. Although for you and I, since we tend to kind of talk more contemporary topics on the weekly Box Score Geek Show, I don't think that people would be really, really happy if we waited until, say, next week to release our thoughts on the Denver Nuggets trade. Yeah, good evening, Dre. Great to talk to you again. Yeah, we were talking about before the show a little bit. I'm not totally caught up on all those podcasts, but I like them so far. And um, yeah, Ben Guest and Dave Barry are super smart. Dudes. it's it's rough i mean we waxed a few about you on both episodes of the funny funny reality that you as the producer get to miss is waxed effusive and then when stuff hit the editing floor the weird tangents where we were like all saying nice stuff about brian some of that hit the cutting room floor but you still showed up ah, the in fix favorable in. Term, <laughs> in favorable terms on both but then of course the, the trick is unfortunately both dave and ben were around during times you weren't around so that that has yeah. been been the rough part although um here's hope and fingers crossed that ben will actually be sharing your time zone in the near future Ooh. so it would really be nice i would say to get the you I, I could probably just listen to you and ben talk i'm willing to bet um particularly if you're talking like college hoops and stuff yeah he said he liked my politics which i'll take that instead of my basketball knowledge that's a better compliment let's go for both um <laughs> all right so today's topics just kind of getting back in the flow other thing i've been doing brian i'm kind of proud of this i've been getting a weekly article out at nerdnumbers.substack.com and two pieces i did want to talk that are contemporary i wanted to talk to Marta rosen brian you are on fire this year about being right so we're going to give you some credit for demar Rosen. we're going to talk a russell westbrook versus go bear fight which I think was not much of a fight. Of course, we got to go over your Warriors. I mean, they're winning, they're losing, they're winning, Brian. We got we got tons to say. And we're going to review just kind of a weird trade the Nuggets made and I'll bitch a little bit about how I'm sad about the state of the Nuggets. I'll complain a little bit about the state of the Nuggets. There you go. All right. Apologies, Brian. Okay, let's get going. Oh, changes in perception. This is the, the first one I want to talk. So there are two articles I put up. I put one up on DeMar DeRozan's Game Winners. I say very condescendingly, and then what about Russell Westbrook's posterizing dunk versus Rudy Gobert? And one thing that I really liked as a theme tying these together is perception versus reality in sports. So a funny throwback for those that may have forgotten. Last year, you and I actually recorded a really good podcast about if DeMar DeRozan was overpaid. And at the time, my argument was, DeMar DeRozan was playing above average. DeMar DeRozan was on a very reasonable, almost Clay Thompson-like contract. So it's a high price contract, but not a max contract, which means salary cap-wise, it's very favorable. In the modern NBA, it's very, very hard to gauge a $20 million contract. So DeMar DeRozan at $28 million a year, back when we started doing this, would have been the top paid player in the NBA. He's not, I think he's like near or just outside the top 20, Brian. And, you know, that's he's just not even top paid. So I was like, he's worth the money. He's fine. Since then, he has gone in a nosedive in production, which you and I have seen. We've seen this. We've seen this story many years of DeMar DeRozan's career. He has this hot stretch. His wins produced numbers even will agree that he's star player or star level for that stretch. And then he kind of cools off and ends the season around average. He's actually below average. The, the one comment we've given on that is DeMar DeRozan for – last year for San Antonio and this year for the Bulls is listed as a power forward. And you can get into this. This, this is always a, an interesting one. You can get into arguments if he really is a power forward, but when you look at the lineups being rolled out and the players and what their responsibilities are, he is the power forward. And this actually runs into a funny point about certain metrics wins produced in particular, by the way, every box was just be wins produced per box plus minus any box score or descriptive statistic even like the ones you see at espn that are like here's how many if you see a metric that says here's how many wins a player produced this season which a lot of them have done that is a descriptive stat which is just telling you what happened and part of the frustrating reality of any of those stats is it is included as to how the team used them so let's say you've got a player 
um, that could get a lot of passes and the team doesn't use them to pass and their production goes down. You go, well, they could be worth more, but that's not what we're saying. The argument we're having is what they've done. So DeMar DeRozan has really been getting played as a power forward by the Bulls and last year by the Spurs. And for that position, it's not doing great. What he had been doing great for that position was just scoring really well. And that's kind of gone down. And one of the weird things that happened in the midst of him going down to below where I would say he's um, not overpaid. So we were arguing, is he overpaid? I said, no, he's paid fine. I would agree now that he's overpaid. <laughs> but so, oh, Go ahead, go ahead. Oh, I, I was going to say on that is, but part of that I would also say is that's how the Bulls are using him. It's like, if you pay $30 million a year for a starting power forward that is not a good starting power forward, that is on you. So, like, you made a bad decision to overpay. So I'm kind of on the fence on DeMar DeRozan because I think as a shooting guard small forward, DeMar DeRozan would be worth the contract he's on. With how he played last year for the Spurs and this year for the Bulls the first half of the season, I would argue he's fine paid. But at this point, I'd say you're maybe not doing the best thing uh, with power forward. And some of that might be related to, like, Vucevic coming back. I think he is slowly starting to get healthy. He's a player that we have loved traditionally but was really, really bad to start the season. I'm going to try and sneak a peek really quick. Uh, he's still got awful, Brian, but his numbers have gone up from where they were. So I think he is slowly getting himself back to form. So we'll see. Yeah, and when we did have that discussion originally, I had actually been convinced by you. Um, I wasn't super thrilled with the Rosen's production, but his salary was structured differently than I thought and was more team-friendly than I thought. So I was like, yeah, I think you're onto something here, but I, uh, again, I'm starting to agree with you though. Sorry, Dre, I'm a pushover here. Um, he has <laughs> played a little bit worse and I think power forward is the wrong position for him. Um, this is the biggest kind of, um, place where we split apart from other analysts, right? Is I listened to some NBA podcasts and, you know, warriors podcasts and whatnot. And there's just this idea out there that size is a race to the bottom, right? Got players like DeRozan, who was a shooting guard, now as a um, power forward, and we're just not going to have centers at all pretty soon. And a lot of people just think that. And, of course, you and I disagree, right? If you go too far in one direction, like playing DeRozan at uh, power forward, even though the Bulls are winning and doing pretty well, they're one of the worst rebounding teams in the league. So... Maybe they'd be even better if they had bigger players out there. So um, I don't think their winning proves necessarily that DeRozan is playing the right position. He has improved a lot, though. Um, he didn't used to do as much big man stuff as he does now. He's a better passer than he used to be. Much He actually takes threes now, and he's not great at it, but he didn't even used to shoot threes at all before. So, hey, I'll give him credit. He's improved. But, um, yeah, the Bulls could probably be using a little better, especially on defense. Although one thing I, I need to definitely write up at some point, and we, we talk this all the time in the show, is kind of inflation. Because the the annoying reality of DeMar DeRozan is if you look at his shooting efficiency as a power forward, it's slipping. So he right. is at 57.3% true shooting. The average power forward is at 56.3%. It is worth noting there was a time in NBA history where if you were, you know, like Horace Grant shooting 55% was very good. That would be bad now. And that's that's what makes the NBA really, really difficult. Because, you you know, I'll, I'll give you an example. So tonight, and by the way, hats off, Joel Embiid had a great game. But I saw some numbers that are saying, you know, Joel Embiid is the first player to score a 50-point game in this many minutes, which is true. And Joel Embiid, if we look at his efficiency numbers in terms of production, he's fine. Last year, he managed to hit star level per minute, but he did not. He was not able to really hit what we've called um, Dre star, meaning getting 10 wins in a regular season uh, because he was just too injured. And this season, he's fine. He's above average, but he's not. He's not star production, as in twice as good as an average player. That's Brian Starr. And he's not going to hit Dre Starr, as in 10 wins in a season. So Good old Seth Curry has the most wins for them right now. Yes. Yeah, we love Seth Curry. Um, that's a, we'll, we'll see if Steph Curry comes up when we start talking the Currys, because uh, Steph Curry, I know, is having a, an interesting year. But Joel Embiid, what makes him rough is people start going, oh, my God, look at his numbers. These numbers are like Hakeem Elijah one. These numbers are like Shaquille O'Neal. And you go, 
if he was putting up these numbers in 1996 or even 2006, that would be amazing. But if you look at him putting up these numbers in 2022, he has to be more efficient. He has to have fewer turnovers. Some of these small things are really hard to notice too, particularly if you're looking personal fouls and turnovers, which people don't pay attention to and shooting efficiency. People have never paid attention to in the NBA. So that's particularly rough. And, and that's really the issue. Like if we look at DeMar DeRozan, one of the things that's hurting him is he was much better than a power forward at shooting efficiency. And now he's just good. And that's kind of what, what's, what's hitting him. And like I said, it did make me laugh to watch when you and I were debating that he almost like was like, I'll show you, I'm going to be overpaid. And like I said, the, the thing that really got to me was perception versus what I saw in that when he starts putting up these game winners, people are like, oh my goodness, DeMar DeRozan MVP. There are people going, you know, like there were, some stupid ones. You got to love this, Brian. Like saying DeMar DeRozan has more. Let's see if I can phrase this. This was a real tweet and it's true, but hilarious. DeMar DeRozan has more made field goals than Steph Curry. See if you can spot the flaw in the logic. <laughs> He's taken like twice as many shots. Is that what's going on? <laughs> He's taken more shots and, and less threes. Made as many threes. Yeah, so Steph yeah. Curry has more points and Steph Curry destroys it. I think he's got like a thousand more points and fifteen hundred more assists. So it's like it's not even close, right? When we ask what Steph it's like, yeah, it's like you DeMar DeRozan instead of passing the ball or making shots, missed shots and didn't pass the ball as compared to Steph Curry, who either would pass the ball or make it. And yeah, you can't really compare the two. But so he's at, he's getting perceptions as a winner, as an MVP and he's making like these game winners and you're like no, he's just chucking. He's just chucking and he's not good. And it's bizarre because I'm changing with uh, with public perception. The other player we might talk in a second is Russell Westbrook. Same idea, which is, you know, that that's in our wheelhouse. When we go perception, not matching reality is always fascinating. And it is weird to see what people focus on. And I've, I've used this term before and I'm bringing it back for DeMar DeRozan. I call it the BS game winner. I'm stealing this from Jay. Um, from uh, Bill James of uh, basketball analytics fame. He came up with this term. It used to apply to pitchers because in baseball, you get the win if you are the pitcher that is in when your team scores the winning run. The flaw in this logic is baseball has what's known as relief pitchers, meaning people that come in after the starter is done. So you can come in when your team has a lead, give up the lead, your team retakes the lead. You were in when your team got the win. Should you really get credit for the win on your stat sheet? Obviously, Bill James gives his answer with the title BS win because he calls it the blown save win. And we're the same way. It's like if you were shooting so horrendously that that you're the reason your team was losing the game, you do not get credit for putting the very last shot of the game in that helps your team win the game, especially if you end the game below average. Yep. Yep. And this is what we always say, right? This is where the eye test fails is because even if you literally watch every single game, every minute of every game, just the way your brain works remembers things wrong, right? It overemphasizes these things like the game winners. Um, you know what's interesting, though, Dre? I've got to derail this slightly because, well, not really. So here's the thing. Um, you brought up Steph Curry versus DeMar DeRozan, right? And they're shooting and everything. So I brought up the good old boxcargeeks.com player comparison tool. Stephen Curry would actually... He does play point guard, but if he were to play power forward, he'd be a better power forward than DeRozan. Um, not only is his, you know, if we just get rid of position adjustments and look at raw stats, the good old ADJP48, Curry's much higher than DeRozan. We, we have said this, by the way, for years, and I want to keep this on the record, that a lot of stuff with Steph Curry is odd in that, I, we, you know, of course he is an amazing scorer, but what makes Steph Curry – amazing and in like his mvp he is ridiculously good at rebounding not just for his yeah. position for his size i've noted this before steph curry well, so just real quick that's the end of my take he's been a better rebounder and shot blocker per minute than DeRozan. so anyway go ahead dre yeah so if i recall okay so steph curry is six foot two which i mean isn't super undersized but in the nba that is not a great size and if i recall this this was the um, the one thing that I, if I recall, was kind of a giveaway on Steph Curry. I seem to believe, yeah, his wingspan, according to this, um, and I don't know how true this article is, but we'll, we'll believe it 
for the start of this is basically going Steph Curry has got is six foot three and his wingspan is six point three is six three point five. Yep. And what kind of makes that interesting is in the NBA, for instance, some players that were really great, um, they just have giant wingspans. So like Charles Barkley and Dennis Rodman were undersized, quote unquote, but they had giant arms. And that's there was a book that came out um, called The Sports Gene that was really fascinating. It pointed us out that 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 while height and wingspan are correlated, the real secret sauce of the modern basketball player that made them good was long arms because being mobile and being able to you know grab balls or put balls in from far away is the secret sauce. Steph Curry is an anomaly in that he is short relative to most basketball players and doesn't and, and his arms relative to his size aren't really big. And so with that in mind, how good he is at rebounding is, is kind of ridiculous. And the same point, you know, we the 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 Warriors have had some amazing defenses. And I think it has just been uh, a misnomer that Steph Curry is not, you know, I think it's always been like yeah, Steph Curry's great, but you know he, he's not great on defense. I'm like, none of the numbers back that Steph Curry isn't fantastic on defense, both in the types of teams he's been. Like, how do you have a starting point guard on a team that's got a bad, uh, that that has a defense that is <laughs> as good as those were, as well as him getting rebounds? Because part of getting rebounds is staying in front of your guy on D. So I, I just, you know, I we, we, we love Steph Curry around here, and I got to shout his praises even more. Oh, I could start that. talking about the Warriors now, but we're going to wait, right? That's a different segment. All right. Well, well, let's finish up another, you know, perception versus reality. So this is one where sadly we, we mostly agree with perception. And then there was one game where I was like, well, what are you even talking about? So this is Russell Westbrook. Shout out to number one Lakers fans, Chris Vance. I guess you can as two. So you're so good as a Laker fan, Chris Ye. We're going to give you two slots. We're giving you number one, number two slot. Another funny player that comes up in that, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Break this down. If you cut Kareem Abdul's Milwaukee Bucks and Los Angeles Lakers in half, he'd have three MVPs on both teams and a finals MVP, which incidentally would still place him in top 10 for MVPs, like that combination. So Chris Shea, very much like Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. You can cut him in half and still have a top Lakers fan, apparently. Did I save that, Brian? Do you think? What do you think? Okay, there, we'll, we'll keep going. I think we just celebrated an anniversary in 1972 Kareem scored 50 points for the Bucks, so yeah, he was very good on the Bucks as well. All right, uh, 50 scoring 50 points for the Bucks. I might be mixing that up, but he did have a 50 point game for the Bucks. And then so, of course, the other great, great MVP Finals MVP that did that for the Bucks as well, Giannis. So boom. Okay, so but anyway, Chris noted that Russell Westbrook was very much like Dwayne Wade, a player. MVP caliber. Both Dwayne Wade and Russell Westbrook we are like absolutely MVP caliber player, but age got them both. And age bought them both quick. You know, LeBron James is, thank goodness he's in the league. It's nice to have players near our age, right, Brian, that are still playing. <laughs> It's, now that it's, Vince Carter is retired, I'm older than anyone yeah, in the league. I'm, I hate it. I right? know. <laughs> I, I'm so I'm so angry at Vince Carter for that. I think I might. Ha I think I'm maybe one or two. But oh, I think that, Haslam that. is still around there, right? So is Haslam playing or is he I don't just know. Active? He might yeah. not be. But I'm much older than Haslam, unfortunately. Yeah. Okay, but anyway, so you know, there are some players like LeBron James that stick around, but you know, Wade and Russell Westbrook, the, the age curve came from quick, and a lot of that was athleticism. When Chris Yeh mentioned that, he kind of said, you know, he saw Dwayne Wade, he saw Westbrook, and was like, these guys aren't going to last. And he was right, unfortunately. Russell Westbrook's playing okay for the Lakers, but he is a shell of his former self. And another funny thing, when we were talking kind of position, when we were talking to Marta Rosen, I would say the same applies to Russell Westbrook, which is Russell Westbrook is a triple-double machine. And now he's on a team with Anthony Davis and LeBron James. And unfortunately, his skills are pretty redundant. Um, meaning, you know, you don't need him to be, the, you know, LeBron James won a finals MVP, at least according to like basketball references settings, which we copied, being a point guard. Like, if you've got LeBron James to play point guard, you really don't need Russell Westbrook. It is kind of a shame people are starting to like bash GM LeBron James because, you know, really keeping Caruso, keeping Danny Green, there were better players the, the Lakers could have kept. Keeping Montrez Harrell would have all been better for the Lakers, which is kind of a bummer. And additionally, Russell Westbrook has hit the other side of the age curve and is playing poorly. Last season, he had a slow start, returned to form. This season, he's had a slow start. We'll see if he returns to form. He's fine, but he's not what you want to be playing max 
contract to. So the perception has turned on Russell Westbrook, which we agree with. Now, what I always get careful about there, I've said this about like Carmelo Anthony, is like, listen, just because a player got old doesn't mean that's who they've been their whole career. So anybody saying this season, oh, this is, you know, this is why Westbrook is terrible, which is odd. I'm like, you you weren't saying that when he was with OKC, so bullshit. But anybody going like, this is who Westbrook is like, no, this is not. This is a much different Westbrook. This is a less efficient, which is rough because Westbrook was never that efficient, but not as athletic, not making simple shots. And people agree. People have been agreeing that Westbrook is hurting and mocking LeBron James for bringing him to the team, and 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 indeed bringing Russell Westbrook to the last couple of team to the last couple of contenders. There's a meanness, right? Russell Westbrook to the Wizards didn't matter, but Russell Westbrook to um, the Rockets and to the Lakers has hurt a team that you know w- went really far in the playoffs the year before. But he had this play against Rudy Gobert, and it was a posterizing dunk. And I wrote a piece over at nerdnumbers.substack.com about this. And I first I went, curious about your opinion on this, Brian. I have never understood the logic of viewing a posterizing dunk as embarrassing to the player that got dunked on. Because this is a person that is willingly standing their ground in front of an NBA athlete. And I said this in the piece. Any and almost any NBA athlete would be like the giant at your gym, would be how you'd refer to them. I, you know, I saw Shane Battier once at a Sloan and <laughs> like, you, you just, you're like, holy cow, this giant just walked through the room now. And he look looks like a regular guy on an NBA court, right? Yeah. You look at him on an NBA game. And you're like, who's that short, who's that short scrappy guy over there next to Shaq. And then you see him in real life next to humans. And you're like, who is that giant over there that, you know, is, is, is popping, you know, he looks like the freaking Hulk, right? He's going to pop out of his sports jacket any second now. So I, I mentioned that's so like anybody who has the willingness and like Russell Westbrook, I kind of want to look this up too. Hopefully the typing doesn't come over too loud through my mic, but like Russell Westbrook is a giant, right? Russell Westbrook six foot. Okay. So not that much. I guess he's the same size as Steph Curry. So Steph Curry is a giant as well. Russell Westbrook is six foot three. I guess he's got like 25 pounds on. He's Steph a little Curry. bigger. Curry's got so a he's lot like thicker more, though lately. More built. Yeah. Oh, interesting. So. No, but Curry started out really thin, and Westbrook has been pretty big for a while. So, yeah, he's you're probably right about that size comparison. Yeah, and I guess what I'm saying is that if Russell Westbrook was charging at you and you stayed, you, you, you held your ground, I would be like, holy cow, that is impressive. Um, and the same, like, so Rudy Gobert got posterized. So I'm first like, that's a, that's, it's not embarrassing. And then I, I watched the play. I, I tested it, Brian. You and I have both turned into eye pests. That's right. Eye pests. I like that term, Brian. Eye pests. Hmm. Are those people that use the eye test too often? People that use the eye test in annoying fashion. Eye <laughs> pests. Brian, I think we've got this oh, week's title. No. So, you know, whatever player we decide could be rushed for. We'll see how much you, you talk it. to Warriors. I'm a dad. There <laughs> we go. There we go, Brian. Good point. Good point. I love it. Okay, so. But we've both turned into we've both turned into eye pests this season. And I ran down the play and basically was like Russell Westbrook did basically a pick and roll with LeBron James and uh Bojan Bogdanovich. Lot like LeBron James was making him look Le- ancient LeBron James was making Bojan look young or look old, I guess would be the phrase. Boyan, and it's so, Boyan. No, it's Boyan, thank soft you. J. Yep, soft J. Thanks for being here and correcting yep. any mispronunciations. I apologize. And it's all it is, you know. This has been something that's been coming up against like. Hey, ESPN. listen, for like three years, I thought Boyan and Bogdan were the same person. And I'm wait, like, wait, there's two Bogdanoviches in the league. So it took me a while to figure it out. The 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 first initial same last name is so annoying in NBA land, especially for some for certain scrapers, certain types of it. But anyway, but uh Boyan lost LeBron James, and as a result, like um Gobert was caught flat footed and he can't really do it. It's not his fault. Like, it's like, it's like, okay, my options are I go guard Dwight Howard. Who's not taking Dwight Howard was sitting on the outside and you're not scared of Dwight Howard taking a mid range or three, three point shot. So it's like either I go guard my guy and I don't get posterized or I get posterized doing my job in an impressive way. And I'm going to steal another bill. Jamesism. bill James, um, at least from the book Moneyball. So Moneyball talks about bill James and the history of analytics 
Bill James got upset at certain analytics, in particular errors in baseball, because what he noted is there there the way an error is counted is if you're a player that's that's near a fieldable ball and you do not field it properly, it is counted as an error. And this can get contentious, right? Is that it was it a really good hit that was hard to field, and that's why you got an error, or did you make a mistake? But he made the very astute observation, if you are a good defender and rearrange your position and get in front of a line drive, that's a hard ball to field despite being in front of it. Versus if you're a bad defender and aren't paying attention and don't get in position, that's a clean hit. So giving an error to certain players is, go, is ignoring the fact that they did their job. Same thing here. So when I reviewed the play, um, the Lakers versus the Jazz, I was like, you know, Gobert did his job. Like, Gobert, the, the the defense completely failed, and Gobert was the last best hope, and anybody in that position would have failed. And there are a couple other notes about uh, about this posterization. And so my take was, I was like, Gobert absolutely destroyed um, Westbrook in the box score. And the Lakers did win, but the, the reason the Lakers won, this, this, is, this is just delicious to me, Brian. Part of it was Boyan, but the other one was like, Donovan Mitchell. Donovan Mitchell's <laughs> terror. Because Donovan Mitchell and Rudy Gobert are feuding. And here's the annoying thing. Oh, I, are they still to, feuding? I they're still that. feuding. Because oh. apparently what Gobert did is Gobert called out Devin Booker's defensive hustle. And what people uh, – uh, this is wrestling. What We've a said troll. This forever. What a troll. But we've said this forever, that this is wrestling, where people want to not only do players feed into feuds – Media and fans want feuds, right? So if we're watching two teams, we could say these are both great athletic competitors and we want to see a very fine display of skill and sportsmanship between these two teams. Alternatively, we can say like, man, Kobe and Shaq got beef. Heat versus Lakers is going to be a major matchup, Um, which was true, right? right? Like the NBA had to love that. That was like a Christmas game, if I recall the first season. So we construct these narratives. And so like Gobert and Mitchell fighting has been a story in the media. It was before COVID. COVID added fuel to the flame. It remains a story and people are more than happy to fuel it. And then, of course, I think this is something you and I have argued. The athletes, we think, notice that and and definitely play into it. It's so interesting. Um, Yeah, I mean, Gobert. So here's the thing, like. I've got a theory about posterizations. I think it comes from playing on the playground. That when you're playing on the playground, you know, winning the game can matter to you, you know, beating the other team in a pickup game. But it doesn't necessarily matter as much as proving you're a better player than who's ever guarding you and vice versa, right? So, um, so yeah, I think that's where not wanting to get posterized comes from. It's your ego, um, you'd rather, instead of trying to stop this guy from dunking, you don't want all of his buddies to say, oh, look at that, you know? So um, I think that's what it's about. And then once you get up to the NBA level, that seems ridiculous, though. But, you know, you, that, that gets ingrained into you after a while. But to your point, the players that are the best defensive players in the league, like Gobert, I imagine Draymond Green is up there, too. Um, they're getting posterized all the time because they're putting in so much effort and not just letting their ego, you know, I mean, those guys have big egos about other things. Right. But in terms of their defense, um, they don't care about getting posterized. They have a lot of confidence. So that's, that's my theory about it. And then that, that's even what, what should be noted, right? Russell Westbrook in that game ended up five for 14 made 15 points on like less than 50% true shooting. Cause he got to the line a few times. And even that posterization, he got teed up right after. So it's like he got a three-point play that turned into a two-point play because of his behavior, which isn't that – it's like, well, it's impressive, but not that impressive. It's like other other point, if you were able to posterize Gobert, which was an amazing play, why didn't you do it every play? Um, because you couldn't. And I, and <laughs> yeah. I, I made that observation. That's like, right. In that game, so the NBA has got tons and tons and tons of possessions. In that game – uh, according to Dean Oliver's statistics, according to pace, was a 96.7 pace, which means basically each team got 97 possessions. So that's, you know, almost 200 possessions. Like if you have 200 possessions, eventually some random, you know, 
game winning, you know, bullshit 27 foot game winners out of DeRozan will happen. Posterizing dunks on a mismatch will happen, but it's that consistency in and out, in and out. And that's, that's what that game actually showed. Rudy Gobert's box score for the game was great. Russell Westbrook's box score for the game was poor, but he managed to get one good play in the middle. And the reason the the jazz lost was really just a bunch of their players that normally shoot, you know, 30 to 40% from three couldn't hit the broad side of the barn. It's possible the Lakers had good defense, but they're not a good, you know, they're 19th in the NBA in defense this year, I believe. So it's like the, the jazz had a bad game. Russell Westbrook had one good play. Um, it's ridiculous for anybody to think that Gobert is bad because of that. And I remember the same thing happened last year in the playoffs where Gobert looked ridiculous on like a defensive slide. And it's just like, you can go – this is a point Coach Nick has brought up at B-Ball Breakdown before. You go over any player's film history, you can make a highlight reel of them being the most amazing player That's in the right. NBA or the worst player in the NBA because every player in the NBA plays so much. Uh, I'll briefly get this. I'll see if I can bait you, Brian. This will be our, our brief football talk. Like the um, – what was the team? I think the Patriots. Didn't they have the best SRS in the, the NFL um, this year? If I recall, it was looking at pro football – Patriots they, are mediocre. Um, it's got to be someone different. Oh, well, maybe. I don't know. Look, so, but, that, but so this is the point. So I look at in, football outsiders more than football reference, but okay, I'm so curious now. What, what I'll look at really quick is I'll look at pro football reference and get my take. So according to you know the, the metric that we tend to like using, which is strength of schedule adjusted point margin, apparently a, our ad for – stupid stuff came up so right now the buffalo bills in the afc are the best team and they did they 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 threw like a perfect game that was an amazing amazing performance in round one and that's also funny though they're an 11 and 16 which is you know the third best record they had to play a play-in game but amazing amazing srs the dallas cowboys apologies brian the dallas cowboys were the best and then of course they fell in the first round the the uh the patriots though 10 and 7 record second best srs oh um, interesting in the so in the playoffs two of the two of the best four teams in football already got bounced but what i would argue easily is it is really really hard to look at srs for those teams here's what i'm hoping so there's our brief talk i just don't know anything about football srs so you're not gonna yeah, be able me, to yeah me, me here. Me, <laughs> but, but what, what, what i'll say is we got packers versus 49ers brian yep. who are you rooting for uh, it's it's so easy oh, to oh no rogers right now oh yeah you got it <laughs> no i mean i used to be an air rogers fan but those days are over yeah i mean 49ers for sure i mean I made a tweet about that where I said it's a selfish wish of mine, but I really want to go back to making fun of Nate Silver for bad sports takes to questioning if Jokovic is, you know, the top tennis player of all time and rooting for Aaron Rodgers instead of whatever the hell this is. So I I agree wholeheartedly there. But the Green Bay Packers are mediocre, according to SRS, despite having the best record. But an easy, easy answer in football is they had, you know, one game, Aaron Rodgers was out because he wasn't vaccinated. Fucking moron. Sorry, Brian. Sorry. Sorry. But Aaron Rodgers was out for stupid reasons, and we lost a game we should have won. And week one, Aaron Rodgers, you know, and kind of on his side for this, was 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 doing contract arguments, and so wasn't at training camp. And so he didn't get, you know, they didn't agree about him playing on the Packers. You know, it was, it was a myth that he was like going to go to the Denver Broncos for a while this off season. So he showed up week one, looking out of shape and had a week that he missed. So it's like, you have two bad games now in football. There are only 17 games. Now it used to be 16, only 17. That is such a variance. Whereas basketball is the exact opposite, right? You've got like 200, you know, hundred possessions a game, 82 games in a season, right? So you've got like, 8,000 possessions to look at to get a judge of a team, whereas in football, if I recall, I think I looked at it back in the day, I think it's like 20 to 30, you know, snap, you know, uh, possession if you're calling like times up the field, right? So like you basically get like 300 possessions in a football game versus football season versus 8,000 in NBA, which is why it's so much easier in the NBA once we get to playoff time to not really be surprised by what happens. So one thing about NFL regular season versus playoffs is there's so many injuries in the NFL compared to regular season. So Packers, for instance, my understanding is they're getting like three Pro Bowl caliber players back for this game. So that might have been why they scuffled earlier, not just that Aaron Rodgers missed game. So um, 
And uh, then, yeah, the last game of the Adam, season. Adam, the small sample size, right? The small number of games. And things are just not as predictive in the NFL. Well, let's let's even throw that back to the NBA. I always get really incensed when people are like, every team deals with injury. And it's like, listen, there is a major difference between if you lose Derrick Rose or Manu Ginobili, these two players missed the first round of the playoffs in a number one upset. There is a major difference between that and if you lose like the seventh guy off your bench. Hey, Derrick so, Rose is looking pretty good for the Knicks this year. It it pisses me off. I mean, here he Derrick Rose is is that is in that Kobe range. It's so much overlap with Kobe, right? Where he's a player that we think is was good. We just don't think he deserved MVP. A player that you know we think was probably worth a max contract based on his performance. Oh, I thought you were going was, with they both had sexual assault allegations. And I was going <laughs> to say that, and that's oh, the okay. frustrating part. So it, it's so much overlap where it's basically – it is very, very annoying when my take is this is a very talented and good basketball player that is overrated and too much stuff is swept under the rug. And, and part of that um, – don't want to go down this too much, but just you know we've agreed it's like – it makes complete sense for the athlete to do everything that they've done, including the off the court stuff, right? It's like it is it, it they're they are they are acting rationally, which is frustrating. And then it's kind of like in a, an annoying way to start sounding political. Like it's the media we're upset with. It's like you're you're playing us wrong, etc. All right, Brian, let's get on to happier things. Let's get on to your Warriors. And you and I are pretty sure we're joking. I was like, I'm been as into this NBA season. You're like, I've been all over it. I've been watching every game. I, you know, I've been watching the, you're, you were saying you're watching the bad teams, right? oh, yeah. you're watching everybody. It's easy to be really enthused about basketball when you've got one of the top teams with an MVP player. Although I was going to say, I'm, I'm curious all the stuff that will go over, but Steph Curry, he's playing good this season, not MVP Steph Curry though. So what are your opinions on all that? Yeah, that's right. Um, Warriors fans think he's the MVP of course, but um, yeah, I'm with you. Uh, I think he's getting a lot more help this year than usual. And he has had some shooting slumps at times, especially lately. And that's kind of a big part of the reason why they have scuffed a little bit. Um, They're still the number one margin of victory team, but they've fallen down a little bit back to the pack. And the margin's not as big as it used to be, and they've gotten blown out a few times lately. But they're also still blowing out teams themselves as well. Um, I'm not worried about Steph Curry or their shooting. It's just kind of ups and downs in the seasons. And um, they've got a lot of good shooters. Bigger issues for them are, number one, uh, Draymond is hurt right now. He had COVID, and then he hurt his calf, I want to say. So he's missing a few more games, and he's just been so good for them. Um, him getting healthy again, beating COVID, and whatever other injuries he's had. He, he had COVID last year also, I should say. So <laughs> stop getting COVID, Draymond. Um, but, yeah, he, but he's playing great. Clay is also back after two years, and while he looks pretty good physically – his play on the court, his production is is not good. He's just become a chucker, like ball stopper, putting up way more shots than Curry. Not really making him. Again, though, everyone's happy with him. Clay's back, but I think he's gotta I think he's gotta be better. That's been hurting them. Biggest issue with the Warriors, though, is that they just had a really soft schedule early in the season. And now they're starting to go on the road more. They're starting to face some better teams. So um, I think we're seeing more of their real level play right now, which is still, you know, near the top of the league, not, you know, historic team, but still pretty good. Their defense is still looking pretty historic, though. And again, we're talking about, you know, fans versus us and Steve Kerr um, and other podcasts. Um, How can you start Kevon Looney and Draymond Green together where neither of them can shoot threes? Um, There's, you know, no floor spacing. Well, if you're the number one defense, it doesn't matter, right? They're just crushing people on defense. Looney and Draymond are so smart and good at defending. And similar to the sports stream book you mentioned earlier, even though they're shorter players, they have long arms. So, yeah, yeah they're playing really well. Dr- well, I, I've mentioned that. So I brought this up earlier this season as well about the myth of small ball. And, I mean, what was funny is if you if you review the top of the NBA, and I know you and I have done this frequently, and this kind of applies most seasons, but this year, right, as an example – Rudy Gobert, Nikola Jokic, um, Sabonis, Robert Williams, Time Lord, we love him, Jared Allen, uh, Giannis. Uh, Giannis, I guess, is is getting counted as uh, 4.5, so I guess I'm curious if basketball reference agrees with us, but we're basically saying based on his size and labeling of a power forward, we're we're kind of labeling him as power forward center. 
And I'm curious about, yeah, basketball reference agrees, 56% power forward, 44% center. So, you know, every, we, so many good players are centers. Now, of course, if you say the center position has evolved from back in the day, and this is very much true, right? Old, it wasn't, Nikola Jokic can shoot threes and pass. That wasn't necessarily typical for old centers, but the center position hasn't lost any value. It's just you're asking players to do more, but that's actually all positions, right? That's the funny reality is that what you are asking everybody to do to be a top tier NBA athlete has just gotten harder and harder. And people are still able to do it, which is remarkable. It's good work. So this idea of small ball taking over, and it's like the only two teams you can really point to are the Bulls of the 90s, uh, 96 through 98 Bulls, and then the the Warriors. And that's like also a weird one. Like it's basically like the first Warriors that won that first title. They had Bogut. And the second set of Warriors, they had um, they had Kevin Durant. And it's really hard for me to be like, Oh uh, yeah, your 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 small ball lineup of Kevin Durant, uh, Draymond Green, and then a small forward, basically in that third slot, Clay Thompson, Andre Iguodala. It's like I don't think you get to call Kevin Durant, Andre Iguodala, Draymond Green, or Clay Thompson, Kevin Durant on um, Draymond Green. Sorry, there we go. I don't think you get to call that a small ball lineup when you've got like a seven footer, right? So same with the 2012 go. Heat. That was kind of a fake small ball team. Well, then the twenty they, they had Bosch, so it's like, yeah, I mean, it's like okay, no, like, but they it, they called it a small team at the time, right? Because, you know, before Le- that, people were playing smaller or bigger. I'm sorry, Le- LeBron James and Bosch is a power forward and center. They also it played just, Birdman, Chris Anderson, quite a bit. Yeah. Like they played big and, and good old Haslam, right? He was around back. Then. <laughs> yeah, that, that that team, I I can't even understand what you would say, but it's just like no. The, well, I'm just truce- saying that was that was the start of small ball, from what I understand, is the twenty is the LeBron and the 2012 Heat. But, but I agree but with you, you. But all of these are like okay. Well, if you've got a slightly undersized power forward that can play every position, guard through center, you're small. It's like no, that's that's yeah. having a star, which is the same same bit of logic. So, so that's anyway, right. Apologies on that. I was going to say, so another few interesting Warriors comments I got to throw out there. He's not an all-star, despite the fact that he may start, but Andrew Wiggins is playing all right, Brian. Mm-hmm. He hits that territory of you are not upset with him in the slightest being a starter for your team. He's overpaid, but guess what? If you've got Gary Payton getting paid like 10 cents and you know agreeing to help mop up the floors after games, you can afford to overpay, heck, Andrew Wiggins and Clay Thompson. So, you, you know... Andrew Wiggins actually, you know, having that improvement. And it's very frustrating. This is such a weird one where it's going when a player is below average and overpaid and you insult them and they get themselves up to average and people are like, oh, don't you feel silly? I'm like, no. I'm like, that was this. This is a miraculous outcome. And even with our miraculous outcome, you, you're still getting you're still getting outspent. Right. You're still spending your money poorly. So why would I be proud of you for that? Yeah, no, I'm with you. Um I think it's just a yay points thing. Like he's shooting a lot of threes and he's up to 40 something percent on threes. So it's like, ah, Wiggins, it's just not paying attention to the other things that he doesn't do. Like he, he's one of the worst, like despite me saying the Warriors don't have very many ball stoppers, he somehow doesn't get any assists at all. He's one of the least assisting players in the league. And, you know, he has limitations. His two point shooting kind of sucks at times. And he still takes, you know, some of those fadeaway contested shots. But um, but if you overlook is... those minuses, his defense is really good. His three point shooting is good. So, and he scores a lot of points. So I can see why people are saying he's a fringe all star. I just don't see it. He's not a fringe all star, but I mean, no. he's an above average player. And by the way, the easy box score geeks place we come back to is like, learn to shoot free throws. Sixty eight point eight percent from the line. Freaking, uh, that's 10% below league average uh, for his position. Additionally, he's 72.9% for his career. So it's like... He also doesn't get to the line very much either, so... Well, that's that's kind of actually... Honestly, that's what's frustrating is that's honestly good, right? Um, Although, (laughs) despite the fact... Well, kind of. I mean, that's still good enough from the line that you'd be happy with him shooting. The point is, though, if he were to become a legitimate star and make that contract money, he'd need to figure out how to get to the you know, get to the line more and make his free throws. Get to the line more, make, if he got to the line more and made his free throws, he might get up into like 
at his peak, we, we were like, well, Clay Thompson is not really a real star, but we'll, we'll call him an all-star and it's okay. He could maybe get up to peak Clay Thompson level if he did that. But that's still, you know, that's still the other thing, right? Is he is, he took two massive jumps or three massive jumps in a row joining the Warriors yeah. in terms of efficiency. He was a 50% true shooter the last two years in Minnesota, jumped to 54% his first season with the Warriors, 57% last year, and is it's 59.3%. So it's like if you were counting on a 10-point jump in true shooting efficiency from Wiggins to be worth it, fine. But if you could do that with Wiggins, you could have done it with anybody. But yeah, sorry, we've, we've harped this point before. Uh, hopefully, it looks like Gary Payton played last game. Uh, he was out a couple yeah, game back. injuries, but I'm, I'm hoping he's back. And I mean, I think the other advantage, you know, we, we talked this beginning of the year, even soft schedule is, is you know, the Warriors, the, the wins are what matter, right? Like they, they're, I think they're currently second behind Phoenix in terms of win-loss, but within striking distance there, they, you know, Memphis is on their heels, but beyond, you know, the good news is, right, Phoenix, Golden State, Memphis, Utah, they've got a pretty sizable gap in front of the bottom four, Dallas, Denver, Minnesota. Hope Minnesota makes the playoffs, but, you know, Minnesota and Los Angeles both have a 500 record right now and are in the playoffs. So it's, you know, if Golden State can make a top four seed, if Draymond and Curry can be healthy, I think you're, you're more than fine in the playoffs. Yeah, it's, it's funny how the season's been going. Um, earlier in the year, it was just those three teams in the West, and the rest of the West was really bad. And then the East was just overall better conference. But now we got Memphis is making this big run. They're up to, uh, let's see, six overall, right? Let's get this margin of victory started. Yeah, they're up to six. Dallas is up to eighth as well. They're playing better. So um, the West is starting to get a bit better. And um, those top teams in the East haven't quite figured it out yet. Uh, although Milwaukee, I think, has been playing a lot better. Man, and I'm looking at Memphis, just a really quick rundown. So Steven Adams, a player we've loved forever. You know, you got to love that OKC in both iterations, in both the Harden iteration and the Harden less who was traded for Steven Adams iteration had some amazing players that have all gone on to play well for other teams. It's like, it's ridiculous how OKC let, let that ball, let it, they let the Kevin Durant, Russell Westbrook core with other good players fall apart twice, which is, you know, that's egregious, but uh, Steve Adams is playing great. Tyus Jones has looked good. I think we've liked him in the past. Contra I think is new, but is playing very well. We've loved Brandon Clark in the past and is playing well. Your boy, John Morant, the, your, the rookie, your favorite rookie tends to keep doing well because I think you liked Mobley this year. John Morant in the past, they both look good. Uh, Desmond Bain is playing fine. Melton's uh, kind of back to his old self. Kyle Those Anderson's, are all young guys, though. To get anything from them is pretty impressive. Like, Bain's a rookie, right? Or second-year player? Yeah. Yep, and Kyle Anderson is is ancient, but Fountain of Youth yep. being a, a, a replacement-level player. And I'm trying to see if they've got – the, the rough ones, and I, I know these two have popped up, which is really hard, is Jaron Jackson Jr. and Dylan Brooks. And so this is almost this is almost maddening when you look at how good the top of Memphis is. Just really strong. Oh, you're going to catch some young... heat from Anna Jane Smith. She Hope loves not, both I, of those players. <laughs> I mean, just you you can't you can't be a power forward. We were just saying this, right? We're like we were caught. We were saying. DeMar DeRozan at 57% is not an accept, you know, is barely passable as a power forward. Jaron Jackson, 53.2%. Now, when he was younger, he was a little better, but he is just, he has not been good ever. Like he has been a below average player his entire career. And same thing with Dylan Brooks. I'll give a shout out actually to a uh, former guest of the podcast, Ben Guest. I love that expression, Brian, but Ben Guest. I'm sure he's Mark never Wilson. heard that one before. Yeah. I, I, I've got to make sure he hears it as many times as possible, uh, with especially how many times he's been on podcasts. But Dylan Brooks and Jaron Jackson have been terrible for four years, and th- they're both still getting major minutes on Memphis, and it's maddening. And, you know, we'll, we'll just have to see what happens with the playoffs. If they get shoved out of the playoff rotation, then Memphis is scary versus they could very easily turn into a Houston with Austin Rivers uh, and Jeff Green, both of whom are still on my nuggets, Brian, which I love. Um, but yeah, all right. Anyway, that's that was kind of a uh, Golden State state at the top of the NBA. I think I think Golden State's in great shape. Very Shaq center me. If if you know, basically, you can view Draymond Green and Steph Curry as Shaq and Kobe, but better. I said it. They're both healthy for the playoffs. You guys are a favorite. 
Yeah, they just really got to keep Steph Curry healthy. He did miss a game or two lately with rest, I want to say. And uh, they could, those were some of those games they had trouble scoring, and they could not score at all. So um, they have so many defenders. We haven't even mentioned Andre Iguodala yet, but um, he, he looks like his old self in spurts, although he's playing limited minutes. Um, he still looks great. So, uh, yeah, their, their defense is going to carry them a long ways. It's just can Steph Curry – and the offense carry them even farther. Yeah, and they're, what, 12th in the NBA right now. But I, I'm not worried in the slide. No. Okay, this one will actually go quick, even though it's our last topic, Ryan, then we'll, we'll get to shout-outs. Uh, the Nuggets did a trade, and they basically traded off Bull Bull, which is kind of a bummer because he was kind of a fan favorite early on. I, you know, was a really good college player and super tall, so I certainly love that. I just but like him because I was a fan of his dad, Manute Bull, when he played. Manute Bull. Yeah. Now, Manute Bull's another one of those sat, one of the tallest players ever, amazing at blocks and the rest of his game. He just couldn't couldn't do it. Um, but Bull Bull just what has not been good. And this is a point, didn't come up much on this show, but has come up on many previous shows, which is if you are an NBA team, you really, really, really should not be counting on young players on your team, even if their college numbers looked great. Namely, you can draft those players, you can bring them up slowly, but any NBA team that thinks they've got a shot in the playoffs really should be going for veterans. And Bowl Bowl just hasn't looked good, but the, the whole reason the trade is bad, and let me see if I can get the whole thing up in front of it, is I believe it's, I think the Nuggets lost P.J. Dozier and Bowl Bowl and got back Bryn, Bryn Forbes, although I'm curious, actually it looks like uh, I'm trying to see if he was still included in the trade, but basically the Nuggets get back Bryn Forbes, who we would notice has never been good. Um, it's kind of weird that he's being called a scorer, if I'm not mistaken, because at least according to his box score geeks numbers, I don't think he's great. So let's let's give that a quick look, see. Because you and I were analyzing this before. I was like, I, I have not been interested. Actually, he's I've he's never all liked right. Forbes. He's, he's not he's terrible, had, but he is a scorer. I, I, I will take that back. 42% from deep. He's fine. I mean, I, I'm trying to look at why he's bad. As a shooting guard, is it just... Um, Let me admit one of my biases right now. He's he's just too small. Um, if I see any small player in the NBA, I'm going to get really like biased against six him. 6'2", 190. He's not that much smaller than Steph Curry. At least oh, but he plays to... really small, though. Steph is an exception because he plays big. You are right. I mean... The, the thing is, as a shooting guard, he is um, slightly – he's below average on rebounds. You're not wrong. He's below average on assists, even for shooting guards. Who he shoots really threes. Kill. That's the one thing he does well, and that's he at a premium. Do, he doesn't block. He doesn't get steals. Um, the good news, he doesn't get personal fouls. But that's not – it doesn't make up for us. So it's like to kind of why he's bad, the one – so here's where he could improve with the Nuggets. The one thing he does well is shoot particularly three. So if the Nuggets give him a green light, he could be an above average player. I agree, though, I'm not super psyched. Um, and, you know, I think what P.J. Dozier, I don't know if Bull Bull was included in the tr in the trade. So I'm just trying to get the full details. So he, he did get traded to the Nuggets a few, or sorry, he on the Nuggets, to the Pistons a few days ago, and they failed his physical. So he went back to the Nuggets. So I wonder if <laughs> the team getting him in this trade has a friendlier doctor. I don't know. Would be okay. So here's here's the full set according to the Richmond Times Dispatch. Oh, thank you. The Nuggets. Okay, so the Nuggets sent injured players Bol Bol and PJ Dozier. So P Bol Bol was included, but PJ Dozier and Bol Bol go to Boston. Those players are both below average, so um, that's fine. The Celtics sent Wancho Hernan Gomez to San Antonio. Wancho Hernan Gomez is below average. The Spurs receive a future second round draft pick from the Nuggets. You know my opinion on draft picks and trades. They don't matter. And the Nuggets acquired Bryn Forbes. So what's kind of funny about this three-team trade is like there is not a player involved in this trade that I would be excited about. So if you're a fan of one of these teams and you go listen to the podcast and the podcasters are saying, oh, we've got some exciting new players in the mix, don't buy the hype. The best one is P.J. Dozier. But then I think what's frustrating is if I recall, he's been being played as a power forward. And if I am not mistaken, the – the Celtics are fine in that, you know, they got the Time Lord, they got Robert Evans. Like Boston, I don't think needs bigs. I think the rough part for Boston, unfortunately, is like their backcourt hasn't been amazing. Uh, it's Tatum has really been kind of hurting him. He's been below average. I guess, I mean, I guess Al Horford's not great. So, I mean, I guess if you. He's saving Al it up Hor for the playoffs. <laughs> Al Horford is the same production as PJ Dozier. So. 
that's kind of the issue is the, the Celtics already have Robert Williams, Al Horford, Grant Williams, who are all better than P.J. Dozier. So it's not really helpful. My like, mean take on the Celtics is that when they had Kyrie Irving, Brown and Tatum were shooting a lot better. They didn't have to be the primary guy handling the ball. And now that those two have to be leaned on a lot more without a guy like Kyrie, their shooting has gone to crap. So it just seems like Tatum and Brown have not proven they can be like the number one star, unfortunately. They're still young enough, though. Who knows? And I mean, well, that's what's funny, by the way, too, in terms of NBA. We're saying you don't go for young players and you don't go for shooting because the funny thing is if you look at NBA statistics, the most consistent stats, the reason your team is winning are defensive stats, are things like steals, blocks, uh, rebounds. So if you are paying for a statistic, if you're trying to fill up the Brian bins of productivity, rebounds are the stat to pay for because you're getting what you pay for. You know what you're getting. Shooting, though, even great players like James Harden, even great players like Steph Curry, they're all over the place, right? Like Steph Curry, I think, is like 59% true shooting this season. At his peak, he's been in the mid-60s, right? It's like if, if if you have a player like Clay Thompson or, as you're mentioning, Bryn Forbes, who all of their production is is in that stat, in their shooting stat, they either have to be a Steph Curry, as in so far on the other end of the curve, that you know you're always going to be above average. And the rough part is even the players that I think of like that, Steph Curry, James Harden, they do every, James Harden is a great passer. James Harden has led the league in passing. Steph Curry can rebound. So it's kind of like one of these annoying things, which is it is really hard to think of a player that only scores as their only skill and is worth the money. So if you're paying up for a player, don't pay up for score. Well, for Brent Forbes, they're not paying much. It's just a roster spot, right? And I think they could try to find a guy that's 6'7 that shoots 40% from three instead. But maybe they couldn't. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know. It's. I mean, the, the, the rough part of the Nuggets, for those that don't know, is essentially all of our good players, all of our like expensive players keep getting injured. We ha- and, and in some cases, you could even argue that they're overpaid. So we've got Aaron Gordon. Michael Porter Jr. Uh, and uh, Jamal Murray. And we, we, we lost Jamal Murray and Michael Porter Jr. And both of those players were above average. Now, Jamal Murray might have been like Jamal Murray is this interesting cat where overpaid by regular season numbers, but he's put up some amazing playoff games. Yeah. Had one of the best the bubble, playoff, right? was amazing. Had, had one of the best playoff games ever against Donovan Mitchell. Had one of the best playoff series. Like Donovan Mitchell versus Jamal Murray in the bubble is one of the greatest offensive playoff duels ever it was a seven game series multiple overtimes amazing performances out of both shut me up in a funny way where i'm like i still think donovan mitchell is overrated i still think jamal murray is overpaid but you know both of them i was just like i'm out you you're, you're fine uh you're, you're kind of you, you you have to really really mess up for you to get on my shit list at this point because that performance like I, i've said the same about like alan iverson's practice rant like all of the parts of his game, <laughs> Hall of Fame first ballot for practice. I'll give it to him. And as Jason Sudeikis noted, I mean, basically Allen Iverson is, is is an Emmy Award winning writer because the practice rant was pretty much taken verbatim by Ted Lasso, which which won multiple Emmys. So, oh, I forgot that. about that. That's funny. All right. Well, uh, I'm I'm actually going to leave the vaccine crap about Djokovic off. Just you're an idiot. That's what I'll throw out there. Like get vaccinated. You could, you could have the, the grand slam title if you wanted it, but that, that, that's, that's the amount I will talk about it. And beyond that, I'm ready to go to shout outs. If you are, I'll just give my standard thing where the fact we're talking about is because he's a rich guy and he can actually get away with this. And he's, <laughs> there's all this money on the line for the tournament. Like you were saying, um, if he was just some regular Joe blow, yeah, I don't know. He'd be in the hospital with COVID. But he's rich, hospital so with matter. COVID or yeah. get fired. And I mean, yep, or get I, fired. I, yeah. I, I've said this about actually, so you're going to get me. Sorry, Brian, you debate me. What has really frustrated me about the pandemic is this weird ignoring the reality of the world that we have created, as in people going, Oh my goodness, can you believe jobs are going to fire people for not getting vaccinated? And going, I hate to tell you, if you were someone that voted basically Nixon, Reagan, Bush, all the way up through the Republican Party for the last 50 years, they dismantled workers' rights, Yeah, meaning that most people are at-will employees, which means beyond, ironically, the woke stuff that the same group seems to hate, beyond certain protected classes of people that, again, fall into that woke category, 
you're allowed to just get fired for anything. You're, you're, if you're an at-will contract employee, your job can basically just say, yeah, we decided we didn't need you anymore. Um, I've been at multiple jobs, even like good benefits, good paying jobs, where the employee manual has you sign something. It just says, by the way, you're an at-will employee, which means two things. We can fire you for any reason. You can leave for any reason. So same note, by the way, any place it's like, ah, oh, you really should put in your two weeks. If that company's at will, their logic is you should be able to leave for any reason. So it has been hilarious in a sad way. So depressingly hilarious. I don't know, dark to watch people. Gallows like, humor. I like Gall it. Gallows humor, 100%, yeah. literally at this point, right, with the yep. stupid pandemic, to go like the people going, I can't believe companies are trying to force their workers to do things they don't want to. It's like, you voted for that. You have literally, if you've ever, if you've had an R next to your name in the last 50 years in any election, you voted for that. And not only did you vote for that, you voted for it for a party that was very explicit. I was, it was hilarious to see, sorry, sorry, Brian, I did get on my soapbox. It was hilarious to see with the Chicago teacher strikes to see people going, ah, he, you know, Biden's really got to pull a Reagan and, and, and shut this union down. It's like unabashedly, you have people that have been behind stamping out workers' rights. So in the middle of this pandemic, to have anybody, and including rich athletes, rich entitled athletes, get the how dare they try and tell them what to do. It's like, no, you have been fully behind that. And it sucks, and I agree. And it's, it's weird to be in a position where not only now do I have to agree with the stance that I've hated for years, it's like this is the one case where I would actually say that is acceptable, right? All of these other workers' rights that have been stripped, getting rid of unions – what the hell were you thinking? This is one case where I'm like, no, this is this is where the safety of the other workers, right? The safety of the company, the safety of everybody is involved, where it's acceptable. So it's it's hilarious to be like, you chose the one place I was going to disagree with your take. And that is hilarious and gallows, as you went. Okay. Anyway, shout out to Brian. Let's go happy. You got any or I've got one for sure if you don't. Not any right now gonna watch some nba this week all right shout out to the nba that's actually got <laughs> you back i'm gonna shout out christian ramirez and the reason is he's been doing this is uh, I'll, I'll include a link on the show notes but christian ramirez on twitter he is a former uh, cracked writer and video producer currently does a lot of you know freelance stuff you can find his stuff on the web but the reason i'm giving him a shout out brian is he was re-watching game of thrones and he has been giving it the same takes you and i did a lot of stuff we agreed so namely the major one i know you and i were hugely on board game of thrones still matters right brian everybody still loves game of thrones i hope but he was basically saying you can say that the last season of game of thrones was sloppy which we agreed with but it is it is ridiculous for anybody to say danny's heel turn was not really like not only logically set up but also forecasted so Oh, yeah. That was something you and I said back and forth. She's I was a like, heel from the beginning, I always thought. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that is the funny one. Yeah, absolutely. Like, she was a monarch coming in with dragons, like destroying everybody. So it's like with an army of slaves, so 100%, Brian. Um, but yeah, it's like, I, I got to give a shout out to that. Someone who agreed with a take we had, what, three, four years ago, however long ago COVID was. So shout out for the Game of Thrones take there. Nice. All right, Brian, that's been our show. We'll see when we're back next. I'm going to try and keep at least something out, so I may do reruns of old shows, Brian, but we've been keeping regular podcast content out. Here is to 20. This is the first show of 2022 with you and I, right? It is, yeah, it is. Happy, happy 2022, Brian. Here's hoping it is not like the last 2020 year that we are, we're still in somehow. Hopefully, hopefully this is the year we get out of 2020, right? I feel optimistic. <laughs> oh yeah the tone of voice gives it away completely brian all right talk to you next time <laughs> bye